Hi everyone, my name is Barbara Medrado. I'm a second year JD candidate at Harvard Law. Uh, I would like to thank you all for coming uh, to discuss internet democracy and political protest. Uh, before passing on to our panelists, I would just like to make a quick comment. Last weekend, I was working at the Admitted Students Weekend with Harvard Law, and one of the things that current students and the admissions office normally say to students that are maybe willing to go to Yale instead of Harvard is that the world comes to Harvard, and this is precisely what we saw this week at the Legal Symposium. Uh, not only the panelists that came to discuss such press, pressing issues in our society, but such a dis distinguished crowd that came. So I thank you all for coming, and I thank also the organization for keeping up the name and tradition of Harvard. So thank you so much. Uh, speaking of distinguished panelists, we will start with uh, Fabio Stabo. He's the executive dis director of ITS. Uh, which is an independent research of Open Government Partnership for Brazil, and also a professor in innovation technology. And then we'll move on to Leopoldo Ferguson, who is a professor of economics at the Universidade de Los Andes in Bogota, and also a visiting scholar at MIT. Now? Good. All technology always works. So my name is Fabro, Fabro Steibel. As far as I know, I'm the only Fabro there ever is. Even if they're all data leaks, I could not find another one. So my email is ofabro, the Fabro at itsreal.org. I will just address you in English because I'm more concerned with people watching this later, although I certainly know most of you here do speak Portuguese because I see very few headphones with simultaneous translation. Um, I came here to replace Ronaldo Lemos. Ronaldo uh, is in New York. He couldn't come. I was coming for a talk in MIT, so he asked me to pass by. And I love to address this topic. Uh, my expertise is in open government. So I try to design institutions that are more transparent, participative, and accountable. And when it comes to election and when it comes to law, there's usually a deadlock, how to connect institutions to people. And when I say connecting them, it's not making people happy, it's how making people part of the government, and also government part of the people. So, in 2013, they asked me to give a talk on what was happening in the streets. We have massive, massive protests. And then, this is one of the pictures that I like the most, when people invade Congress or occupy Congress, although there is no such things as occupy Congress because you cannot occupy something that is yours. But it's kind of like a message saying that we want to be part of it. And since 2013 in particular, there were major attempts to make people be part of the government. So let's consider a situation. The people go there and give a message. We want this. And then the government by then sends a message and say, we do this. But have they communicated? And the answer is no. They haven't communicated in 2013, not in 1989, not today. It's very hard for institutions to talk to people. This is one of the cartoons I like the most, which is the octopus man, which is trying to understand you nowadays. Each one of these uh, things you use is an identity. Each one is a channel. Once I went to the mayor of Curitiba because they used a very interesting system to collect feedback from the people. And they said, we hate the app. I said, why do you hate the app? They said, because now people phone me, now people use, message me, they come through my door, and every single identity is a new citizen that I have to deal with. So I don't have a 1.5 population, I have a 10 million population, and resources are really scarce. The other thing is that sometimes we have this feeling that online process can be deleted. So this is a cartoon uh, making, mocking of it. So we came in here to process the name of deleted. You can delete protests, but you cannot delete protests. I mean, you can shut down the channel, but you cannot shut down people. And it is a two-way challenge. No one communicated with anyone since 2013. No one communicates with anyone today. And I don't think someone's fault. It might be people who are willing to play alone. But it's a very hard design setting, how to open up institutions. 
if you live in a building, you do have a community of 70 uh, owners. It's very hard to make them collaborate. Schools, uh, institutions, it's very hard to open up institutions. And this is one of the cases I like very much. This is from 2014. Um, a, news, a news media, um, O Globo, a major newspaper in um, Rio de Janeiro, they had a Twitter account, which is a very Brazilian way to say, illegal so what? Uh, which means, well, things are illegal, but people do anyway. And people used to use the column in the newspaper and the Twitter to report how illegal things were happening and no one was doing something about it. By then, the mayor of Rio de Janeiro, Eduardo Paes, decided to do something. He went to Twitter and he started replying every message. If you check the Twitter account access numbers, it peaked. For the next three months, was a huge number of access to what Eduardo Paes was doing. But then it went down. And the thing is, the bureaucracy of running a government is not the same as the bureaucracy of running a Twitter account. Which means you cannot pave a road in seconds, you cannot solve uh, health issues in uh, two tweets. So unless you fix the bureaucracy of government, there's no way to do it. And this is part of what we have been trying to achieve in ITS, the Institute for Technology and Society of Rio. So we are in the Panel Research Center, located as an NGO that we act globally in four main areas. This is our team, we are five directors, Ronaldo Leons, who was supposed to be here, uh, Carlos Afonso, Sergio Branco, me, and Celina Bottino. And we are a team in total of 30 people that works in four main areas. Rights and technology, which will be very familiar with most of you here, uh, right to be forgotten, revenge porn, privacy, data protection, and so on. Education. Uh, innovation, where we deal with artificial intelligence and blockchain in particular, in the democracy technology, which is most of the talk that I bring here today. Uh, when you think about democracy technology, we think how can we use technology to enhance channels of civic participation? But don't forget we have the other areas. So when I talk about Mudamos, which is an app here that uses blockchain for citizens to sign digital bills and bring them to Congress attention, we publish immediately a legal piece saying why is constitution to collect signatures for this purpose and so and so. So we always try to achieve the, the, the legal status of it, how could to capacitate people, how to use innovation for public interest and how to enhance citizen participation. We are also the leaders of the network of centers, which is a global network of 80 plus universities. The Buckman Klein here is MIT, Media Lab, Science Point, and so on. And last year in Rio, we brought 400 people from 40 countries during three days to discuss the agenda and investments in artificial intelligence. And we did that from a global South perspective. And most of my talk comes from a global South perspective. So we sent a survey to all participants asking, why do you think is a, uh, the biggest challenge to uh, gain access to artificial intelligence? Part of the groups have all discrimination, bias. The other part of the group said access, capacity building. And then you can see a north agenda and a south agenda in a simple type form. How from the south, the main issue is how to gain access to AI. And in the north, we're already discussing things like bias and diversity of data. So here is a first um, solution to that. This is Mudamus, we change. Uh, Mudamus is a new way for systems to express consent. The new way for systems to support something in the internet. We use our mobile, which is by far the most um, the, the type of access to internet, to internet that's most gross in Brazil and elsewhere, especially in lower classes, especially in disconnected areas of Brazil. And we use blockchain. With blockchain uh, that no one cares about, no one knows about, and we have to explain when they ask, we can bring transparency to the system so people know that when you sign something, somewhere in the internet, somewhere elsewhere, is Fabro signed this. And this brings transparency and accountability to the systems. We won the Google Social Impact Awards to develop the app in 2016. And so far, we have won three other awards. And this is Primavera de Felipe and Aaron Wright book that was released last week. They talk about blockchain and the law. I do recommend you to, to check the, the piece. But what we're doing is not Bitcoin. We're not doing cryptocurrencies, although this is of major concerns. What we're doing is using the blockchain to create a smart contract. And a smart contract is a contract that you establish between peers. And it's public and transparent. So when you think about signing a bill of law, what we're doing is that there is a contract, public, where someone signs and someone can check that uh, signatures and then everyone knows that that signature cannot be forged. 
What we learned with Mudamus? We launched Mudamus by mistake. I mean, we were ready to launch it, but someone did a movie, a record a video in Campinas and put in the internet. And in two days, on a Saturday and a Sunday, days that people are not working, uh, more than 100,000 of the apps were downloaded. Uh, we estimate that 7 million people saw the video the guy did uh, only in WhatsApp. And at that day, I received 7,000 emails, all of them saying, I have a bill of law, I want to submit and collect signatures for that. But when you go and check the quality of these materials, only 7, 0.1% were achieved minimum conditions to uh, start collecting signatures. So people want to participate in democracy, but the gap is way larger than the internet or the app or having a mobile. People really don't know how to write a bill of law. They don't have judicial knowledge. They don't have uh, quite much to participate. So we thought, okay, the Mondamos app work, but we need something else. We need to bring the 7,000 people. There was a truck driver who wrote me. I have a, a proposal. I ring him. So if you have a truck driver who wants to be part of something, we need to create something for them. So we created what we call Virada Legislativa, there was a, which would be a crowd law exercise, where in two hours, people that doesn't have legal knowledge can uh, develop a um, bill of law, write it, and then be ready to submit it to the, to the app. If you have a little bit more time, it becomes better, but it's something we developed for a challenge for the global news organizations that we call Let's Create a Bill of Law. <laughs> We have deployed in João Pessoa, where we created five Bill of Laws, and now we are bringing these possibly to Roraima to solve the energy crisis situations there with indigenous populations, men and women. So there is an app that uses blockchain, but we also get people together in a room with legal expertise to help them to draft Bill of Law. Because the real challenge here, and this comes from the first point of the, the panel, it is streaming engagement. Everyone wants to help. But everyone wants to help when they want to help. So if you create institutions, you have to create a system where small contributions can add up and be used in a rational, efficient, creative way to create something bigger. Think about Wikipedia. When you want to edit something, there's a door for you, an opportunity for you to edit. And then Wikipedia is the largest knowledgeable database in the world right now, and it's free. So in streaming engagement is a key challenge when you think about internet and government and elections. And the basis of all that is trust. We estimate that the minimum, uh, the most scarce resource in Brazil right now is trust. People don't trust government, government don't trust people, and then we need to establish institutions that are able to build up trust, otherwise the results are poor. So Mudamos right now have 600,000 users. Uh, we have more than 50 bills in the app and growing. Uh, Transparency International will include their anti-corruption bills to be signed with Mudamos. Uh, it grows every day, it grows in uses. But it doesn't address another challenge for democracy, bots. So the second project that I bring to present to you is called Pegabot, Trapabot, because it's going to Colombia and Mexico as well, or the Bot Hunter, which will be in English. The Pegabot is an algorithm that identifies the chances, the probability that a social media profile is a bot or not. So bots are kind of automated um, actions that can deploy something. When you talk about social media bots, this is from the MIT Technological Review GIF, uh, we talk about uh, computers that can write messages in a certain way and make them available for social media. You hear about today, uh, Epoca, I think is a newspaper in Brazil, uh, a magazine in Brazil just published a huge magazine about how bots and fake news are related. The thing about the bot is that there are very good uses of bot, and not all bot is bad. So when you start to see kind of bill of laws that try to forbid bots or try to restrict their access, we have to re reinforce the idea that the bot is a technology, depends on how you use it. So the Pegabot is a tool to enhance transparency in the uses of bot in Brazil. We decided to start the project with this search bar because we believe there's a media literacy here. We need to allow anyone with an interest in bots to put a, a profile there and check, including yourself. And in the first two days of the project, we have 200,000 people using the search bar and trying if they were a bot or not. So people do care. And uh, why we should care and why should they care? The first one is that we're coming with elections. 
And elections are a, very, a period of time that's very sensible. If you use bots to manipulate trending topics to harass someone or something like this, it is a big challenge. So the second stage is called the bot news, and we're trying to understand how content and bots are related. One of the pieces we're working on is uh, the bots that beat on women, which is on uh, harassment on the social media, on activists, and especially government accounts that promote women's rights. There's also a growing concern on hate speech and trolling. Uh, in Venezuela, for example, uh, the government is sponsored bots that everyone that has a keyword saying, I want to support this, they were there and said, I kill you. So if you do this, there's a chilling effect that needs to be tracked down. And there is certainly a relationship between bots and fake news because if you publish something, advertisers know that very well, you want to gain attention. And if you know how to use bots and bots are useful, you can gain more attention than um, the usual. And if you do that, you influence algorithms. And then social media, YouTube in particular, will tend to show the content to others. And people tend to believe that this is more important than it actually is. Uh, Latin America is a huge problem with bots, and it's quite similar in Argentina, Colombia, Venezuela. But in Brazil, we are starting to gain attention on how bots are being used. And in the case of political extremism, like in the case in Santander in the south of Brazil, uh, the problem were not the bots. So when you talk about people from the government who participated in the ban of an exposition that were some way related to religion, they said that they received 50 emails. And because that's a huge number, they decided to act. They feel motivated to act. 50 emails for the 200 million population is not a lot. But we must not forget that one thing is Twitter and Facebook, but when I talk about government, 50 people, it's a lot. So if you use bots consciously, you can influence the elections or you can influence how government works because you can make pressure. And this is a good way to use pressure. This is Beta, it comes from Betania. It's a feminist bot from the Nossa Cidades. Beta is one of the first chat bots that was widely available in Brazil to promote certain causes. So, if you talk to, talk to Beth, you say, hi, I'm a feminist bot, how can I help you? Do you know what feminism is? But before uh, raising awareness of feminist causes, what Beta really does is to mobilize people when there is an urgency. So there was abortion vote in the Congress. Beta will call to, call to action everyone who interacted with her and say, Fabro, I need your help. There is something going on. If you agree, can we send a message to this and that? And say, Beta does. And then Beta sends a message to the Congress or to Congress member and help to mobilize the agenda and to mobilize people. Why I bring this slide? Because I spoke about lots of bad uses of bots, but we must remember that there are very good uses of bots as well. And bots can help us to make uh, government citizens, institutions more accountable. They can reduce the cost to analyze data and to provide feedback. So Senata de Amor, for example, a project that Yazo previously worked on, what they do, I think, is very ingenious. They get and use artificial intelligence to analyze how governments spend money in a particular budget line on how congressmen use their own money to, to sponsor payments and lunches and so on. And what they do is that they find outliners. If you find outliners, usually go to the government and say, hey, I think there is corruption here. Do something. But government is overwhelmed with corruption cases, especially small cases. So what they did was to create a Twitter account. And this Twitter account uses the at Deputado Fabro, Deputy Fabro, something like that. Uh, can you explain this bill of law, this, bill, this payment? I mean, you paid it $200 for a slice of pizza. Sounds weird. And then the politician can go himself, herself, and address that. Reducing the cost of the government to check every budget expenditure, empowering the citizens to do something by their own, because citizens can go there and say, hey, Deputy Fabro, this is truly uh, a problem. Come on, answer. And also empowering politicians to learn about the systems. Lots of the things that were discovered by artificial intelligence were not corruption, were just a, a very bureaucratic system that takes a long time for you to know how to work around. And then. The third project I bring to you is uh, something that we are deploying, but we are deploying in a very particular way. I said that if we can do this, no one can say that a chatbot cannot be used for democracy. 
So there is Rio de Janeiro. Rio de Janeiro has a huge security, public security crisis. And we are using chatbots to connect government and civil society to discuss security in Rio de Janeiro. If you use chatbots in Rio with security topics, you certainly can do something about it. So this is artificial intelligence. And then someone did a test. They asked it, hey AI, do learn how to talk with this AI. Develop your own language. And they did. So the language they created is kind of like, I can, I, I, everyone else. Balls have zero to me, to me, to me, to me, to me, to me. This is true. And then it was shut down because it was considered a failure of the project. But if you leave computers work alone, they tend to go non-human. They tend to solve problems, but not in a way that we can use inside institutions to provide a solution. And we also know that if you leave uh, artificial intelligence to learn with uh, the networks themselves, they become, uh, robots are really good to learning things like racism and bigotry. This is a case about Tai. Tai was a Twitter account that Microsoft created. In one day, people start chatting with her and she created a personality. She refused the existence of the Holocaust, she is an infomaniac, and she's really racist. In one day, this is what society told her to do. And you could think that Tai is really mean, that she's really uh, onto something. But she just learned it with artificial intelligence, intelligence that tends to uh, get extremes and value them more than the middle ground. So is the use of artificial intelligence good for society and institutions? Yes, but you need to really understand how it works to all the bias and all the problems related to it, to exclude from this. So there is a super intelligence, and this Nick Bronze, uh, Bostrom book is very good for you to understand that AI right now can provide one service and one service only. It's a super fast um, way to solve problems that humans can solve it in a logical way. So when I teach AI for the health sector, I use House. House is a super machine running artificial intelligence. He doesn't talk to patients. The only thing he's concerned is to gather data for data to solve a problem. That's what House does. So AI can solve problems of governments that government doesn't have the funds or the resources to do it. And this is a good example of that. This is an app developed by the National Health Systems in the UK by a Norwegian company. This is an app that when you have a health problem, you go online and then you use the app and say, hi, I have a headache. And he'll say, okay, what else do you feel? Do you have fever? No. Okay, just go home, rest, and chat, talk to me tomorrow. This chat was a real chat I had when I was doing my PhD in the UK uh, with a doctor. I went to the doctor with a headache. I stood on the line, I entered the room, and I said, yeah, I have a headache. I say, do you have a fever? No. Do you have anything? Have you, have you slept well? I said, no. I said, just go home and sleep. And it was outrageous because I said, I came here, no tests, no exams, no nothing, just go home. He was correct. So this is the use of artificial intelligence that for the first care, drastically reduced the cost of government to provide first uh, a tendency to a large amount of people. Um, if you have a real serious threat, they will connect you to a doctor that with your webcam, you can check and then they will say, go to the, to the hospital now or I'm sending an ambulance. Leave your location on. So this is a good use of technology to connect citizens to government. But how can we use this to Rio de Janeiro? So there is one thing that happens in Rio de Janeiro that's quite interesting. They have a city council, a community security council, the CCS. Here is the only state where this works. Across the state of Rio, there are 62 of these councils that meet every month with an agenda. Security forces, government and citizens, they sit together to discuss an agenda of the neighborhood. Um, and we said, okay, now we can mobilize 3,000 people, but what if we use Facebook for people to engage? And say, well, but people would use, we call in Portuguese testão, kind of like this large mass that say, I understand everything, I'm, doing, I'm not a specialist, so I have do this, that's an urgency. And I said, Facebook is not good for constructive policy making. I said, yeah, it is. So the chatbot helps you to participate in these in this, in this, uh, councils. They say, hi, Fabro. Um, uh, security councils are very interesting. Do you want to know more about it? Yes. So how much you know? Do you know there are six in Rio? Yes. Do you know they have done this and this? Yes. Uh, do you want to know how to engage? Yes. So can you tell me where you live? Yes. Oh, you live here? So you are ISP9. They will meet uh, in 15 days. Do you want me to send you a reminder? Yes, please. Uh, by the way, 
you can suggest an agenda for them to discuss. The president of the council will take the notes and give feedback for you. Are you okay? Yes. So please write it. And then the government can get that suggestion, check if there is something really serious, kind of like a, a corruption case that needs to be reported to authorities, or something that can be uh, need uh, semi-anonymized data and so on, and pass it over. And what we expect to achieve with this is young people, because young people are not participating in this council. And young people are on Facebook. And then you have the favelas, which not all the time can go to these meetings for sometimes security reasons, sometimes costs. And we hope that with a very structured way of using technology, artificial intelligence and chatbots, we can connect citizens to government. Um, so in short, what we're doing is that we get government, you get civil society, and you create a mechanism of civic participation to co-create. There is someone uh, that is with very high expertise on that, which is the Open Government Partnership. It's kind of like a UN for open government. Every country has an um, uh, independent researcher that monitors audits the government plan. I'm the auditor for the Open Government Plan in Brazil. And they have a large expertise in setting this. And you can use technology. You cannot use technology if you don't want to. But the idea is that what the government should be interested on is to create recipes. So this is the Minister of Food. Uh, he self-entitles himself the Minister of Food. But his main idea is not to provide the service, the food itself, but instead to provide recipes, to provide solutions that can be scaled up like a soup of peas and then bring more nutrients to people. So if you think about the government and citizens, we can create recipes, we can create um, programs, we can create uses to scale up what we do every day and we can do with people and government together. This brings participation. So trust, accountability and participation, I think are the three key ideas to advance on how we can open up institutions. So to close, because you are a very specialized audience and I could not mention that, let's talk very briefly on what we're doing on rights and technology. Um, we just published a book on the Marco Civil the Internet, which you all know here, on jurisprudence, on what has been said. And we have been monitoring this bill of law, and it's catching up really fast. Brazil is really a top-notch country in regulating the internet with the judiciary. The judiciary is by far, uh, I would say, uh, the strongest stakeholder in regulating the internet right now. For example, we have submitted uh, amicus curiae in cases of right to be forgotten, uh, responsibility of intermediaries, uh, blocking practice, like what happened in WhatsApp and so on, and more and more in coming. And capacitating judges and judiciary and public servants to understand the issues is key. To, to finish, uh, three days ago, we had a meeting with three lawyers that are dealing with the case of Marielle. Marielle was um, a sub-local um, public uh, elected official that was murdered. We're still investigating why and how, and how, but most likely is a case of militia assassinating. If you saw Narcos, kind of like that. And it's a very sad because she had lots of efforts to uh, help police forces to become more secure and to bring rights to policemen and to civilians as well. And the three lawyers were um, outraged. They said they're mems. They're mems that accuse Marielle of being part of a drug dealer trade. This is bluntly lie, this is just incorrect, this is so untruth, and this is circulating, and we want to remove that from the internet. And he said, I agree with everything you said, except removing this from the internet. And because if you remove from the internet, there is a possible censorship movement here. Uh, but is a crime? I said, yes, but we need, we need to understand how a crime is defined as a crime. I'm not saying it's a clear crime here, but there will be great cases shortly that we will need to address, like if a politician is corrupt, corrupted or not. And this comes a uh, labeling of what corruption is. There are better ways to do it. You can delist, you can um, reduce the prioritization of search engines. There are other ways to deal with that. So what we're doing in the Marielle case is that we are bringing them together to make a workshop, to brainstorm how we can use constructively the courts, the courts to do that. This is something we have done with uh, CGI in Brazil, with um, um, the law school they have and elsewhere. And I'm closing my speech with that, saying that there are many challenges for the internet. It's a very hard topic to regulate. 
and we try to understand how the old government will be incorporated by the new government and most likely will be behind innovation of technology. So I would say the best way to do it is to increase transparency, accountability and participation because the judiciary needs to be incorporated to the people and it's a very challenging, it's a very hermetic um, uh, topic, it's a very hard to make people participate. But I do have one contribution of the judiciary that I like very much. Well, it's not exactly the judiciary because the Minister of Justice, which is consumidor.gov.br, consumers.gov.br. They created a platform, open, where people can, with those companies that agree to, to, to participate, to talk with them, explain their position, and solve online. All the process is open to everyone. They have indicators for solving uh, issues and so on. And that platform, instead of delivering the services of justice per se, it's creating a platform where those with an interest in solving the problem can collaborate. And this reduces costs, bring efficiency and transparency. So thank you very much. Uh, my amazing slide, and I'll be here for the question. Thank you again. Thank you, Fabro. That was really interesting. Uh, Professor Ferguson, we're uh, looking forward to hear your views also. Thank you. Ah, so this is working, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So can I borrow the pointer, maybe? No, the pointer. Good. Um, let's see. Good. So thank you again for inviting me and, and congratulations. I was impressed, I was telling you before we started that I was impressed by the, by the extent of the conference that you were able to put together. It's really an amazing three set of days that I sadly missed, but I'm happy to be part of it today. Uh, so I'm going to be discussing something uh, that I've been working on with a student of mine, Carlos Molina, who's now at uh, Chicago. Uh, and it's going to be a more specific uh, topic, which is basically a question that is in many people's minds, which is whether Facebook or social media in general causes citizen protests. And I'm going to tell you what we have found in this research. Um, but first to motivate it, let me just say that this is something that many people have emphasized, like social media is definitely an important determinant of protests in the minds of many people. And here I have a quote from one of the key organizers in the case of the protests again, against uh, Mubarak's regime. Uh, and when he was invited first to give a TED talk, he said, well, if you want to liberate society, all you need is the internet. Um, and I could give you a bunch of other examples, many coming from the Arab Spring of people emphasizing how uh, technology and social media in particular has been a tool that has empowered citizens in ways that have allowed them to do these collective actions uh, and move out and protest uh, regimes. But I thought that the m most telling way to, to emphasize how people really do believe that Facebook plays an important role is letting you know the anecdote of a guy who decided to name his firstborn Facebook. So he really believes uh, he owes something to Facebook. He's so proud of that that he's decided that his firstborn was going to be named after the social network. Um, now, interestingly, uh, when uh, this guy, Val Gonim, was invited again to give a TED talk, he said, well, remember I said that if you want to liberate society, all you need is the, in is the, in is the internet? Well, I was wrong. So, uh, really the question that many people might take for granted that Facebook and social media in general causes protest is not that simple. So, um, that's kind of the, the question that we want to tackle in this research that we're, be we're, we're doing. And I think that there is this optimistic view uh, that collective action, and it's kind of the conventional view, and social media is good for, 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 for protests uh, and for protests that are kind of good uh, in terms of attacking uh, auto, authoritarian regimes. But much of this comes from really journalistic perceptions that might exaggerate the impact. It comes from like picking examples in which this played an important role, but that might, by not, but that might not be the typical ex uh, effect of social media. And in fact, there are a number of negative effects that you could think that social media can have. And here I have listed just a few for you. It can facilitate propaganda by authoritarian regimes. It can empower a small set of elites. It can facilitate the control and repression of citizens' collective action. It can displace other sources of information that probably have more news content and better information for people. It can, some people argue, crowd out of line act activities. You no longer get together with people and do real things. You only give likes and, and spend time 
on your wall, uh, and it can spread misinformation and so forth. And here there are a bunch of the references that have discussed these kind of effects. So. Um, Social media and collective action might have a more nuanced relation than we might think. So, um, first, before I tell you what we do in our own research, uh, let me tell you what, do, what we know from the academic research on the potential role of collective action, uh, of, sorry, of social media and collective action. So, first of all, I do want to say that there is mounting evidence that the internet uh, and that like new media does matter for political outcomes. So there are well-crafted kind of research articles that do a careful empirical job of documenting how uh, collect, um, the new media may affect things such as polarization. Now, interestingly, uh, the research that's been done on this area has found less effects on polarization than most people kind of believe. They think that we are just in echo chambers and that increases a lot. Uh, the extent of polarization. Well, the empirical work hasn't shown that much of an effect on polarization, uh, but it has shown some activity, some increased in online activity when you have on online political activity, specifically when you have better access to broadband and other things like that. And it has also shown how after a while that increased access and activity online may translate into activity offline, people turning out to vote more um, uh, after they have more engagement with politics online. Uh, there's some work on Russia showing how the internet has helped tackle corruption in this case of connected companies uh, to the government. Um, it has trickled down to policies in some cases. This is work from the UK. It has affected the extent of information that people have. So we do know that new media does affect things that are important for politics, but it is still really unclear whether Online social networks, which are a key aspect of new media, and Facebook in particular is the largest platform worldwide, affect protest, which is one of the key alleged outcomes. We don't really know for sure whether there is an effect there or not. Now, why do we not know? I'll, I'll show you why we don't know. It's basically because it's a hard question. But um, we do have plenty of evidence that social media is used during protest activities. So there is a lot of research looking at whether during protest activities, people who participate in the protests use these networks. And that has given us a lot of information on the how or, or, whether, or whether we use these tools. And yeah, it's used, these tools are used to facilitate information and to use emotional appeals to bring people together to the rallies. It's used for uh, logistical purposes such as like, telling people how to protect themselves from tear gases or organizing a carpool to go to the manifestation. Uh, it's used for a bunch of things. And so we have a lot of research and I, there's even more quotes here to make on the people who have studied how social media is used during protest events. Now, the problem with that, that's super interesting, but the problem is that is that it cannot answer the question of whether we owe additional protest activity or not to the presence of these on online social networks. And the reason that we don't know whether actually social networks are causing more protests is there are three basic reasons. And I would like, to, uh, I would like you to think about ways to, to realize uh, these three reasons that make it very hard to know whether actually the social media is increasing protests. The three reasons are basically substitution, reverse causality, and omitted variables. So from substitution, what I mean is, think of ways. If you have ways and then you start driving using your ways, you could say, well, that person is driving because he has ways. Well, no, before, he's just substituting before he used to drive using his brain, now he drives using ways, right? So he would drive the same, it's only that it substituted one tool for another. He used to think where he was going, now he doesn't think, he delegates that to ways. So that's the substitution, we don't know and here, just to emphasize substitution, the revolutions spread just as quickly in the Arab Spring as they did in Europe in 1848, and there was not even TV back then. So people found other ways, just like we were able to tell where to go when we didn't have ways, and we now think it's unimaginable, well, we were able to go places, no? And before, people were able to, 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 to spread revolution just as they were able to spread the Arab Spring. So maybe this is all just substitution. They are using it because they have it, but if they didn't have it, they would, they would use something else. Now, an additional two set of problems are reverse causality and omitted variables. So the other thing that can happen 
is that I am using Waze because I am driving, not that I am driving because I have Waze. So it could be actually that Waze causes more driving. We have Waze, it's a thing that makes driving pleasant, it's easier, I know that I'm not going to get lost, so I drive more. But it could be that there is no such an effect. I'm just using Waze because I am driving, so the causality runs the other way, right? And finally, there can be omitted variables. If I see people who have Waze and drive, maybe there's a third thing that explains why Waze and driving goes together. People who are techie tend to own a car and they tend to have ways and drive, but there's a third thing that is causing the correlation between these two phenomena, between the appearance of more ways and more cars. It's not that one is causing the other, it's a third factor that is explaining the correlation between the two. So exactly what I just said about ways applies equally for Facebook and protests. Replace Facebook with ways and driving with protests and the, and the, and the statements that I just made are exactly the same. So that implies that this is really a hard thing to test whether social networks actually increase protests. And that's our goal. So it is an ambitious goal because we want to tease out the net effect solving these substitutions, reverse causality, and omitted variable problems. Um, and I'll tell you in a minute how we do it. Now, um, there, is some event, there is some evidence of some other researchers that have made an effort to solve these problems and have found I would say rather convincing effects that social media does increase, increase protests. There is one paper from Russia again that uses a strategy that I would not discuss here but that kind of tries to solve these problems in a credible way and finds that VK, their kind of the, the, the most famous social network in, in, in Russia, increased citizen protests uh, there. Now the problem with that is that that might be just one case. It may be circumscribed to that type of political regime to a particular political moment in which there was a lot of outrage with a fraud in elections and maybe in those cases Facebook, or in this case VK, played a role but in general social media hasn't made that much of a difference so we would like to know more generally in the world does social media affect protests or not. And then there are another bunch of papers that have focused on the impact of mobile phones on uh, protests and conflict and they, found, uh, they have found an effect. The problem is that mobile phones give you social media but mobile phones also give you a bunch of other things. Uh, they give you communication more broadly, they can affect even the state of the economy maybe and the state of the economy may have a direct effect on how much people protest and stuff like that. So uh, we still don't know of convincing evidence at the global level on whether social media affect protests. Um, so what we propose to tackle this, this, this uh, question is basically to use the following strategy. We rely on Facebook's, on Facebook's introduction of language-specific platforms. So basically Facebook was launched in English uh, in 2005, by the end of 2005, uh, and um, then it was launched in different languages as time went along. When that happens, when you get the Portuguese version of Facebook, Portuguese-speaking people and Portuguese-speaking countries have now an easier time interpreting the web page and now have more access to Facebook. But they were not looking for that because they wanted to protest, right? So that's kind of the, the basic essence of the strategy. This works because language is a key barrier to access and therefore Facebook use will, gain, will increase with local language platforms. But it also has the feature that there are a very diverse set of countries and peoples who speak a language that are unlikely to pull Facebook together in a coordinated way because they want to protest, right? So we don't have this kind of, do I have ways, uh, do I have, am I protesting because, uh, more because I have Facebook or I am using Facebook more because I want to protest. We want to check the second thing, not the first thing, and in this case, we know that people were not looking for this because they, they wanted to protest. They just had extra access because they had this kind of exogenous, as we call it uh, formally, like this um, independent kind of increase in the access to Facebook. Um, so that is, that is basically the, the, the approach that we follow. Uh, and to, to, to do that, we basically rely on maps like this. So this, for example, is a map 
that is showing you how many people speak Mandarin in the world, as soon as the Mandarin version of Facebook arises, you can see a bunch of people in China who are going to have an easier time interpreting Facebook, but also a bunch of people in the US, a bunch of people in Canada, uh, in some places in Africa and so forth. Here is the case for English. Uh, so it has been a big, it has, you know, the British Empire uh, has been everywhere in the world. So once it was launched in English, more people had access to, to were, were able to interpret this, this web page. Uh, and this is the Spanish version. So except for Brazil, you have a bunch of people in Latin America being able to interpret the web page better once the Spanish version was launched. So that's what we exploit. And in this graph, what I'm showing you is basically the solid line is telling you how many Facebook speakers, we call them Facebook speakers, were available, were, were, uh, how many Facebook speakers were in the world. So basically, we define Facebook speak, speakers as the share of people who have an available Facebook platform in their first language. So they actually can read Facebook in their first language. So they know how to speak Facebook in a sense. And so that is the solid line, and you can see how as the bars increases, and the bars are basically the number of language-specific platforms launched by Facebook, as those bars increase, the line increases. So basically, as more Facebook-specific platforms were launched, more people were able to interpret Facebook in their first language. Early on, you had the biggest increases because early on we had the launching of the Facebook versions in the languages that are spoken in more places in the world. So you have the Spanish, the Portuguese, the German, the French, and so on. Uh, and why? Well, basically because Facebook wanted to reach as fast as they could as many people in the world. Then when you get to the end of the sample, you're starting adding even like less and less common uh, languages. Uh, but the, that it still gives some people the chance to interpret language, uh, Facebook in their, in their first language. So the last language that we have in our sample was the translation of Facebook to, the, to Assamese. And Guarani was not very, um, was not very um, it was relatively recent also and so forth. So what we do then is to examine whether in fact once the Facebook platform appears in a given language, we see a spike in protests. And this graph, I'm not going to stop in the technical details of how we compute this graph, but this graph is telling you on the blue dots to the left of the zero, so basically the negative numbers in the x-axis, are telling you quarters before Facebook appeared in a local language platform. So before that happened, there was no really difference in protest in places that were about to receive a Facebook platform in the local language and places that were not about to receive a Facebook platform in the local language. Every, uh, both places were basically have similar amount of Facebook speakers and they weren't protesting much. What is showing, what, what we find on the right of the, of the graph when we have these red dots are the difference in the number of protests in a place that now got a Facebook platform in the local language. And you see that pro protests start going up. And the bars around them are telling you whether that increase is statistically significant, that is, whether we can kind of say that that increase is something that we, it's very hard for that to have appeared by chance. And it soon appears that it's something that is very hard to, 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 to be likely that it had appeared by, by chance. So we do observe that as these Facebook platforms appeared, protests seem to be increasing. So it does seem that Facebook is causing protests. Now, uh, this is kind of the fancy regression version of what I, ju I just showed you, which is, uh, I am not going to stop in the details, but this is just, just to mention that once we do fancy econometrics with this, or not so fancy, but in any case, when, once we do econometrics with this and try to make sure that this is not something that is driven by some of those omitted variables that I be, uh, referred to before, it's not something that is special about the countries that got these platforms, it's really not that. We can be very flexible about the types of controls that we put in here to make sure that it's really the increase in the Facebook platforms and not something else what is causing the increase in platforms. Moreover, uh, if you want to see what's the magnitude of this increase, uh, I'm showing here, here in the solid line kind of a counter, uh, uh, an exercise in which I made the, the following thought experiment. What would happen had there been no local version of Facebook? So let's assume, we know that that wasn't the case, let's assume that Facebook speakers in the world are zero. And let's take my estimates and predict how many protests there would have been. 
and basically there would have been the, the um, dashed lines instead of the solid lines, which accumulates over time in our sample period to about 15% more protests because we have Facebook uh, than we would otherwise have, would have observed. Right? So it's kind of a sizable effect over time. We've seen 15% more protests than we would have observed otherwise. Now, one reality check. I'm telling you that this is because once the local Facebook platform is launched, people can use Facebook more. Well, let's make sure that that's the case. So we can go and ask Facebook, hey, Facebook, can you give me your user's data? I want to know how many people are using Facebook in each country so that I can make sure that once you launch a local uh, platform, people start using more the web page. And Facebook tells you, no, I'm not going to share, you the, I'm going to share the data with you. So we try to do some bots like that will kind of go into Facebook and count how many people were from each country and they were able to block all of our attempts. So we are not as good as Cambridge Analytica as getting data from Facebook, too bad. So what we ended up doing was relying on Google searches because it turns out that the Google search for Facebook is typically a Google search to log in. You open your computer, you have the bar there, you put Facebook and you want to get into Facebook. So what we are looking here and all these positive numbers with the stars, what I'm telling you is that Facebook speakers increases Facebook searches. So it does seem this, this reality check that once you have this local version of Facebook, people start getting into Facebook more. So it does seem to be driven by what we expect it to be driven, which is more Facebook use. Now, with this strategy, we can ask a bunch of interesting questions. One of them is, okay, so we know that Facebook increases protests. Where? Where is this increase more pronounced? And it is more pronounced in places where there are more internet users. You would expect that because if there are no internet users, they cannot be using Facebook. That's another reality check. But more interestingly, the effect is bigger where there is no press freedom and where there is repressed opposition suggesting that Facebook then becomes a tool for information because there is no freedom of information or for coordination because you are basically in a kind of repressive regime in which you cannot coordinate otherwise. Uh, it's also particularly, um, um, we also find, sorry, that this increase in, 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 in Facebook speakers um, seems to be a uh, worse in bad times. So this is GDP, this is, sorry that this is not showing up, but when there's, uh, sorry, this here, when there's more GDP growth, there is less of, an, of a reaction in the increase in Facebook speakers. So in good times, people don't react so much to this additional tool. Uh, finally, interestingly, we didn't find any effect in the month of elections. You would think that those are kind of important times. And yes, there are important times in and of themselves. In months of elections, you have more protests, but it's not that Facebook is increasing that sensitivity which is this, this number over here, which is not positive, it's not large, and the fact that it doesn't have starts, this simply implies that it does, it's not statistically significant. We cannot rule this being just an effect of chance. Um, another thing that we find is that the effect is bigger in places that have other reasons for conflict. So the literature of conflict and turmoil suggests that resource-rich countries or countries that have more ethnic and linguistic polarization are places that are more conflict-prone, we find some evidence there, not so much for, for ethnic and linguistic polarization, which are columns one and two. Uh, this interaction with Facebook speakers is not really important. But when we look at all uh, resource-rich countries, it does seem that resource-rich countries react more to these Facebook speakers. So it seems that this tool increases protests, and it increases protests more where there were other underlying things that tend to make the conflict more, the country more conflict prone. Finally, interesting things about who reacts is when you look at democracy. So in these graphs, I'm showing you the different measures of democracy that people use in the literature, and I'm showing you the effect that Facebook has on protests by levels of democracy. And you can see that it's typically kind of a U-shape. So it's typically the case that we're seeing that Facebook is increasing protests more in places that are either very undemocratic or very democratic. So you can come up with explanations for that, but one possibility is if it's very undemocratic, you have a lot of reasons to complain for, but there's a lot of risk if you complain because maybe you get in real trouble. So there are these two kind of benefits and costs, but the reasons to complain are so important that once you have this tool, you complain. In a very democratic place, then you don't have that many reasons to complain, but you know that you can complain safely. So, you know, if you have a tool to complain, well, you'll complain. In the middle kind of 
the two things kind of cancel out and you don't react too much. So in one place, the strong reaction is because the strong grievances are driving the thing, and in the other extreme, the it's easy to complain, is driving the effect. That's one possible theory, but we could come up with other theories why that's the case. In any case, it's interesting that it's, especially in very democratic and very undemocratic places, where Facebook seems to be increasing protests. Now, um, another thing that we did, all that, we just, that I just showed you, was based on country or within country level data. So data from news stories telling us how many people, partic uh, whether there were protests in a certain country or in a region in a certain country. What we can also do is we can pull together a bunch of surveys from many, many places in the world, individual surveys in which people are asked, did you participate in a protest in the last 12 months? And we know from those surveys as well, whether that person speaks Spanish, Guarani, uh, Portuguese, or whatever, so we know if that person is a Facebook speaker or not. And we find with these data also reassurance that Facebook speakers protest more than non-Facebook speakers. So again, like very consistent evidence that Facebook is increasing, is increasing protests. Now, with the survey data, what's interesting is that we can see who is reacting. Is it the young, is it the old, is it the women, is it men, is it people who are more educated, less educated? And what these tables show you is that for the World Value Survey, which includes a bunch of countries around the world, the European Social Service or, or Survey, obviously European countries, and Afrobarometer in Africa, we find in general that people of all ages are kind of responding. This is the average participation in protests, for instance, for World Value Survey, and then you have the effect, the additional effect for speakers and so forth for each one of the, of the surveys. The only place where you see kind of a difference by age is in Africa. In Africa, it does seem to be different in the sense that it's the younger who react more and the older who react less. But in the other regions, it seems that everyone is kind of reacting to this. If you look at men and women, it also suggests in all the set of surveys that both men and women are reacting to the Facebook uh, and increasing their participation in protests. You will see also that women tend to participate less, but they are both reacting, right? Finally, by, by education level uh, and by wealth level, we find something similar to what happened with age before, which is in Africa we see a, different, a difference where more educated people tend to, uh, to participate and react more. Uh, so here we have the more educated people in the bottom part of the upper panel. And in Africa, these more educated people are reacting more. In the rest of the world, everyone is reacting. And in, case, and in the case of wealth, it's interesting because it seems that everyone is reacting. It doesn't seem that poorer or richer people are reacting more. Now, the final thing that I want to, to share with you is a persistent question, which is, okay, so uh, Facebook may have these effects, but people are disengaging in some other ways. People are participating more in protests, but they are no longer part of a local community organization, they are not longer appealing to their political leaders, they are no longer talking to their friends and doing things like that. They are no longer voting because maybe they just now write something on Twitter or Facebook, but they don't believe in the system anymore and they don't vote, whatever. So here the table looks with a bunch of holes because we don't have the same information in all the surveys. But we look at a bunch of other political participation measures, such as voting, uh, expressed interest in politics, expressed the um, discussion of politics, uh, uh, expressed reaching out to a political leader, whether they are a member of associations and they attend those meetings, whether they are willing to sign petitions and have signed petitions, whether they identify with parties. And what you can see about this table is that, in general, there are not many effects. There are no stars here, that's my way of saying, like here, we cannot say statistically really that there's any significant effect of this. So that non-effect is kind of a surprise because we have a lot of people saying, well, Facebook disengages people or makes people behave differently. They are not going to do real stuff anymore. There was a famous article by Malcolm Gladwell saying that, you know, Facebook emphasizes weak ties and you are no longer uh, strengthening your strong ties, which are the ones that entice you to do real stuff. Well, it doesn't seem that we find any evidence of that. Um, a related aspect is whether people are 
leaving some other sources of information, such as, for example, they are not reading the newspapers anymore because of Facebook. So sure, newspaper readership has gone down, but is it because of Facebook? Maybe it's a more general phenomenon that is not specifically tied to the social media. And actually, that's what we find. We find that people are no, Facebook speakers are no less likely than non-Facebook speakers to listen to the radio, look for TV, look at the newspapers as sources of information. So again, when you rely on the journalistic accounts, you may exaggerate because you may hear stories of a guy who's no longer checking the radio anymore ever because he just looks at Facebook. Well, yeah, but that's not the average effect in the world. The average effect might, might confound what happened to that guy with the fact that other people get a link on their Facebook wall that says, like, look, this cool thing that happened in the radio today, and then they tune in with the radio because of that. So the average effect that we're finding is basically zero. It's not much disengagement on average. So to conclude, one key thing which is not easy to establish is that we do find that Facebook causes protests. Uh, and to the best of our knowledge, this is the first study that kind of does that at a global scale in a convincing way. And we have a number of complementary results that underline the potential role of information and coordination. There is a bigger effect in places where there is lack of information, like places with no press freedom, in places where you need some tools of coordination because you are repressed. Uh, we find these interesting nonlinear results with democracy. The effects are in very democratic or very undemocratic places. We find a stronger effects in places that have underlying reasons for conflict. And we, surprisingly, don't find any clear crowding out of other political activities or news consumption. And in Africa, finally, uh, we find different effects for the younger and more educated, but in other places in the world, we find that everyone is responding. So I think that with that, I wrap up. Thanks very much. Thank you, Leopold. That was really enlightening. Uh, I see our time is quickly elapsing, so we'll, unfortunately we will only have time for one question for each uh, panelist. So, uh, starting with Fabro. Uh, Fabro, can you give examples of technologies that can be used by the judiciary to help judges deal with their huge caseload? Yes, so uh, if you use artificial intelligence, you can organize documents. Uh, we were helping an environmental agency in Brazil because they have this huge lag of uh, documents from 70s, 80s, and so on, a pile of paper with mug on it. And if you scan and if you use artificial intelligence, you can easily create a database with name, date, and people mention it. I'm not talking about finding who gets what, but when the, someone needs that data, you can easily create, recreate this database to search for documents. This is a really low entry level. A second one would be to use, for example, blockchain for you to track payments made to the judiciary, which will can decrease corruption. Because then you know when a payment is made, you can trace back where that money went through the system until it leaves to another agency or back to the citizens. If you do this, there is no real money, it's just a tracking record that makes really easy for something to happen. Uh, in terms of chatbots, there are some opportunities for the judiciary to open to citizens to participate. If you design a chatbot that is very simple and do one specific task, you can increase by 10 times the number of people who engage with you and reduce the time you have to running that, um, that task. So these really, really simple things that can be done with a very low budget and so on can be done. If you want to go to the sky, uh, you can always use artificial intelligence to try to understand if someone is guilty or not. I advise you to don't do it. You can always use blockchain to transfer payments. I advise you to don't do it. And you can use chatbots for to people complain whatever they want. Don't do it. So uh, the best way to do it is what we call idealization, which is basically uh, get a morning and then you present the challenge you have for experts and tech people. And then for the next two hours, they will say what you can do. And then you try to become with an MVP, a minimal valuable product. So something very simple that can, you can know how much it costs, who will approve, and so on. So then you can start to put technology in place in the judiciary. Thank you. 
Um, Leopoldo, do you think that governments should use technology to avoid uh, uh, demonstrations and that governments should use Facebook to identify demonstrators and punish them? Um, I think I have this on still. Well, no, I don't think I, I agree that governments should do that. I think that surveillance of citizens is a violation of citizens' privacy and, of course, there may be gray areas, but in general, I would be very wary of any attempt to surveil people uh, because I think it's a slippery slope that can lead to authoritarianism. Now, sadly, the question in many cases is, whether they sh is, is not whether they should, <laughs> but what do we do about it because they will. <laughs> so, so or, may, or they will have the temptation to do it. So, so, so I think those, those are kind of my two reactions to that. We have to live with the reality that many regimes might likely have the temptation to do that, and perhaps what we, have, what we have to build is kind of robust systems that actually protect citizens so that we can defend kind of the basic tenets of democracy. Uh, and, that's, and that's a horse race. So that's also important to bear in mind of what we found here in these results, which is these results that I show you are circumscribed to what happened with Facebook and protests from the period up to 2015. But we have seen how increasingly, like all sides in the political game, start to use the tool and start to learn. So maybe this effect that I showed you for the years past is not going to hold in the future because now governments are getting better at using that information as well to prevent protests. And maybe there are not going to be as many protests and maybe the net effect in the next few years is going to be that actually Facebook is a great tool to avoid uh, citizen dis dissent. So there is this harsh reality and I think we have to live with it. Uh, it is a technology, it can be positive or it can be negative for democracy, it is a horse race and let's hope that like civil society and, and the basic uh, uh, social groups that can move in the way of using these tools in a positive way for democracy win the battle, but I think it's a battle, like any other battle in democracy. Yeah. So thank you so much for the two of you and also the crowd that came, thank you.